And each one of us has an astounding and beautiful destiny that God dreamed up before he even started the world. Um, destined before time began in the affections of God to be sons and daughters that display the fullness of Jesus in his character and his power to all creation around us. That's who we are. It wasn't just a random thought in God. We may be just catching on, but he's had the thought about you since before the world began. If you remember the beginning message of this series, I was running up and down with chairs. This whole series actually fits together. It was actually planned, <laughs> some by me and mostly by Holy Spirit. But you, you, each one of you was destined in God, in his affections and in his thoughts before time began. To be a son or a daughter that would display the fullness of Jesus in his character and his power. All right? The church has deleted the power of Jesus from its idea of character formation or becoming like Christ. Whereas it was never, never intended to be that way. I just read yesterday in my Bible reading that I am called to do the works that he did and greater works. It's just there in a very matter of fact way in John 14. You're like, Still working on it, Lord, still working on it. Every single one of us. That's how he imagined us being was these incredibly loving, supernatural people that were taking, which is the very image of God, to the nation around us, the people around us, the creation around us. And, and some of what we've been looking at last week and this week is maybe like some of the things that hinder us stepping in to to the beauty and power of what he's already purposed for your life because it's truly breathtaking. Every time the father thinks of us, he gets deliriously excited. Every time our heavenly father thinks of you, he gets deliriously excited about you. Like, after, you know, if you imagine that everything about God is extreme, his love, his peace, his joy is off the charts, and a lot of it is focused on what he's got for us, what he sees in us, and what he's drawing out of us, and what he's planned for us. And every bit of love and affection we point at him, he's like, oh, this is amazing. He loves this this morning. Just absolutely gets so excited when his people start celebrating him. So the beauty and power of what he's purposed for your life is truly breathtaking. And there's nothing sadder, certainly in my experience, to see good, godly men and women lose their passion, start to lose their dream. It's heartbreaking to see that kind of loss that it's not like they're lost, they've stopped showing up to church or lost their faith, but just kind of a bit switched off, a bit stepped back, a bit cooled down. It's really sad to see, isn't it? I'm sure you've observed it too. And we were looking at last week this whole process that ends up with people just concluding that for all the promises they've had and the mighty encounters they may have had and the dreams that got stirred in them by the Holy Spirit, they don't really don't want to have what it takes and it's not for them after all. And so they start to dumb down their vision and have a more achievable goal that they could probably do, maybe even without the help of of a supernatural God who loves them. And actually, and because of that, their excitement reduces, their hunger reduces, their expectation reduces, and their vision for themselves reduces, just to something a bit easier, because going after this stuff I'm talking about just sounds just too much. And <clears throat> I realized and we landed really hopefully on two main points, is it's actually quite good to come to the point where it's like, I can't do this. Because it was never about what you could do. As long as we have the next moment, which is his grace is sufficient. All the resources of heaven are available to me because that's actually what I need. You can't become what we just described without being plugged in to heaven like Jesus was plugged into heaven. Without 
being in that flow of Holy Spirit as Jesus was in the Holy Spirit. He was a man full of the Spirit. The Spirit was in and on him without, without measure. We, we, we were never designed to be all about us and what we can achieve and what our energies have got. Hallelujah. So sometimes to get to the point of, oh, I'm not sure I'm up to this, as long as you have the next thought, it's a good thing. It's like, oh, no, I know. I can't become this fullness of Christ in the supernatural without without him and he is eager and desirous of leading us step by step into everything he's designed us for he knows us well he knows our limitations and yet knowing everything about you that's quotes wrong with you he still gave you that idea that dream that encounter that promise because he knows that with him you can be everything he's called you to be how about that despite frailties, weaknesses, shortcomings, not being good at certain things. Yeah? He loves to work with imperfection because that gives him all the glory. And the second thing, which is related to that, is God is for us. Regardless of our track record, success, failure, energy, exhaustion, joy, whatever, where we're at. He's cheering us on. He's fully backing us. And that verse in Romans says that God, if God is for us or since God is for us, who can be against us? And gives a long list of all kinds of things that can't separate us from his love. It's so good to know he's cheering you on. Had a bad week. He's cheering you on. Had a bad year. He's cheering you on. Uh, grappling with some difficulties he's cheering you on he's for you he's for you he's for you and some of that billion trillion volts of heavenly blissful love that fired the planets into being is actually active for you and in you it's worth a hallelujah for, it's for you Sometimes it's good, you know, because it's a preach and there's all the faces in the rooms like, well, it's really for them. No, it's really for you. It's really for you. And then <clears throat> this week's talk, we just want to, this was all supposed to fit into one week and it just doesn't, you know, so that, that's how it is. Um, there's, there's a, so, so we get to that point where we can't do it it's that point where we really need to lean into you were never meant to do it in your own resources but his grace is enough his supply is more than sufficient for you to move into everything he's called you to be and he is for you he's got your back even sometimes it feels like nobody else does he's got your back and he isn't just a passive supporter. He's an active supporter. He's actually working for you in all your circumstances to bring them to a place of good. That's what it says. He works out all things together for good for those who, who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's how for you he is. He's not a passive observer, just a sort of a hype man cheering you on as you run your race. He's actually working in your race to make sure that it works for your good in according to his purpose. Oh, it's exciting. But there's one thing that we didn't get to, a, a kind of a single factor that means that sometimes I feel like you just keep meeting these broken people who have decided that what they dream for isn't really for them. I've met so many who've actually, actually altered the prophetic word to mean something else. Seriously. It's like, I know the prophetic words they had, and then I know what they've now done with them. And I'm like, you've moved it to something that, that you can actually do, and that makes, that makes more natural sense to you than the, the, the supernatural supply you would actually need to fulfill the thing that he's called you to. But that journey just seems too difficult for you, so you've, you've designed it different. And it's such a shame to see. You've calmed it down. There's nothing that attacks the life and efforts of every Christian with the specific intention of 
of clogging up the life of Christ inside of them. So all of us have Christ in us, but it can get clogged up. It's like dams, little dams can form in the river of life that flows out of us. There's nothing more that works so well to start damming us up on the inside as this one thing called hurt. And the opportunities for hurt are super abundant if we're alive. Jesus put it this way, he said, in the world you will have tribulation, that is, which means trouble. It's not just a religious word. It means, it means difficulty. It means in the world you're going to encounter things that don't work how you hoped. And the longer you live, the more of them you'll have. The potential for her is everywhere. And actually, the culture that we live in, you know, the world's culture, has become even more like sensitive to being hurt. Do you know what I mean? Like, it seems to have that thing in it even all the more. And, and we're like, hang on a minute. This is, this is a thing that can clog you up, mess you up, slow you down, cause you grief, m- stop the rivers of life flowing inside your soul more than anything else. If this hurt stuff takes up residence, and it can be there because... <laughs> You ever been in that place where you're just really struggling, you're really in pain, you could do with some help, and you feel like you're like, over here, I'm over here, come on, somebody talk to me. It's a bit like, you know, going out swimming, and you're like, I'm drowning, come and rescue me. And everybody on the beach is like, oh, hi, yeah, having a lovely time, glad night, yeah, we're waving back and walking on by, and you're like, that can, if you felt, felt like that, that can be sore. It can be sore because the thing you tried to do for God didn't work, and it didn't work more than once, like multiple didn't works. And then there's all the kind of potential for relational hurt, leader hurt, family hurt, loss, just loss. Any, you know, insert anything. Loss of relationship, loss of loved one, loss. Loss is a thing to process. Delay can be a hurt. Like, I don't know, still what Abraham and Sarah must have felt like, you know. What was she, like 90-something plus years old when she finally has a baby, having been medically, for what we can tell, unable to bear kids and then becomes too old to bear kids. So you've got the double thing happening in her life what a weight and her husband goes and has a way with the servant girl and she gets pregnant so that's doubly in your face that it's my problem not his and he's also sown his seeds somewhere outside our covenant relationship I mean there's a lot of opportunity and yet it says in, in, in Hebrews 11 it actually says it's her faith even though she was past age, by faith, she received the ability to conceive, though she was past age. Come on, Sarah. <laughs> Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I haven't got time to tell you who he was, but he was a famous preacher in the 50s and 60s. says this, there is no grosser, greater misinterpretation of the Christian message <coughs> than that which depicts it as offering a life of ease with no battle or struggle at all. Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. Hurt can lead to disenchantment, disengagement, can lead you to change your theology, adjust your prophecies, and deep down start to take offense at potentially others and God. Actually, offense is one small step away from the corrosive inner pain of bitterness. And all these things, disengagement, changing your theology, disenchantment, offense, bitterness, all these things start to quench the life Jesus is putting inside us every day by his spirit. He's given us his fullness, but it's possible to grieve, quench and resist the Holy Spirit. So it's really important we don't let these, these things happen, okay? These things are in life, they happen. 
And until we're resurrected with Jesus, they're going to keep happening. I'm sorry, but that's just in the world there will be hurtful things. I just want to, want to give you a couple of passages of Scripture. Because the Bible talks to real life, but talks to real life in a different way than you'll get out of, I don't know, an advice from your neighbor. Let's put it that way. Would you turn with me to Hebrews 12, <clears throat> verse 1. Nothing that happens to us changes the reality of who we are. Nothing that happens to us changes the reality of who we are. It just may change the way we, th we think about us or the way we feel about us. But nothing that happens to us changes the reality of who we are. That's already fixed in eternity past and cemented by the death and resurrection of Jesus. You are his son. You are his daughter. You're destined for great things. He sees beauty in you, and he's pulling you into a glorious, incredible destiny that is both full of great character and full of great power. He didn't call you to powerlessness. He didn't call you to grumpiness. He called you to be like Jesus in his fullness. That's settled. And nothing I feel, nothing I think is going to change that, because that's reality what I'm feeling right now in the is part of the process to realize that reality. Let's just read in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so you just had the whole list of heroes of Hebrews 11, including Sarah I just mentioned. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race Set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised its same shame, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is amazing. So it's saying what I'm saying. It's saying that the, the exact language there, every weight, could be arrow tip and sin. And lots of Christians are trying their best not to be sinful, but my goodness, those arrow tips or those weights can be the thing that actually get us to be running a bit slower. Yeah? So it's saying get rid of the sin from your life, but also get rid of the arrow tips. So the arrow tips are the sore spots where events that the enemy will use to put pain and hurt in your life. And if you remember in, in, in the book of Ephesians, it talks about the flaming darts of the evil one. The flaming darts of the evil one trying to come and lodge themselves in us. And the he writer to the Hebrews knows that and is saying that that can get to you. It can be like a weight and it means that you run with less endurance, with less alacrity, with less energy, with less joy and you just kind of just do what we've just talked about. But you can get rid of them and Every arrow tip can be turned into a glory moment. Will you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1? I'm going to read another bit of scripture. 1 Peter 1. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 5. We who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So he's not saying that trials aren't sore. And he's not saying that trials don't exist. But, but listen, listen. I've got a pencil that I'm waving around. Listen. Just listen, Gideon. You've got to listen to this. Put that down, I'll sort of wave it around and poke somebody with it. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved or hurt by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, 
though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow, what's going on in the fire? What's going on in the test? What's going on? What's, it's, it's telling us what's going on. It's telling us that you are being refined, but it's telling us that your faith is being revealed, not destroyed. And, and I'm going to come back to that. And finally, we won't look it up, but in Luke 4, which is the, the beginning of Luke 4, Jesus has just been baptized and he's heard an audible voice from heaven saying, you're my son whom I love. He said that affirmation in front of the public by the audible voice of God. And then it says that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, leads him into the wilderness to, most translations say, to be tempted. But actually the word there is to endure an ordeal. He's not just to be tempted. He's been, he goes through, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into an ordeal on purpose. And the enemy comes to him and challenges him and says, if you're the son of God, do this. He challenges him to meet his basic needs of bread by his own power and he refuses to do it. He challenges him to take a shortcut to glory by worshipping the devil and he refuses to do it. He challenges to actually throw himself off a building and force God to save him and he refuses to do it. He refuses to put... God to the test. Here he is, hungry, tired, whatever you are, out in the wilderness. Jesus went through an ordeal. And later at the, the, the cross, he went through another, even mightier ordeal. In that Luke passage, as he's coming out of that ordeal, it says that he comes out of it. He's not just led in full of the Spirit, which is what the, as he goes into it, he comes out in the power of the Spirit. What's happening to us in these fiery moments is very important that we have our minds renewed to realize what he's about. Three things out of these passages. In fact, the Greek word for trial that he goes through, we use the same word at origin for pirates. So every ordeal you go through is like a bunch of pirates coming to try and steal your joy, your purpose, your destiny, your peace. But God intends to do three things at least through this one to act as a refiner's fire to remove impurities from us. So the gold of our faith gets tested. So you take gold and you heat it very hot and the impurities that are in it float to the surface in order for them to be uh, wiped away, to be, to be scooped from the surface of the gold in order that the gold could be even finer and purer. You are being prepared for even more glory in the fire of the test. We're taken from glory to glory, but it, it's not without some kind of test, sometimes valleys, pain in the middle, because that's just what happens. The promises are tested. So it's important to have a conscience that notices what bubbles up in our time of test. Because it's God showing us something he wants to remove or renew or change in us in order that as we emerge from this test, we will be moving even more in the power of the Spirit just like Jesus did. So it's important that we don't just tough it up and go through the test. It's also important that we don't just duck and sit at the back and try and ignore the fact. God is engaged with your, actively engaged with every single one of our lives with the goal of producing more and more gold and glory through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of your life is not, no matter what you feel about it, is not detached from this very purpose that God planned before the foundation of the world. He's making you like Jesus, whether you like it or not. 
And every event that we go through is with the purpose of pulling us into a place of greater glory and getting out of us the reasons that we hurt. So sometimes the reasons we hurt are things that bubble up inside us and it's good to stop and say, God, why am I hurting? And allow him to deal with whatever it is he's revealing with you so that you are, the event you're in is able to refine you because he wants to put more glory on you. He wants you to carry greater authority than you ever did before. He's preparing you for something more awesome because he has the plan that he's not given up on and he never gives up on. So that's the first thing is that refiner's fire is there to mature us, to remove impurities. So easy like to go around, like, Teresa's really good at this, like I feel like I'm not an anxious person but she knows that's not true. And I want to avoid that, that truth but it's really helpful to have a helper suitable who makes sure you don't avoid the truth so then I can actually grow in being a more personal pers- pers- people, pers- 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 peaceful person. <laughs> Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? So, so, we're, so we're put in high anxiety situations because you're like, man, I'm really anxious about this. Oh, I know the verse, but I'm not living the verse. So I want to backtrack and go, okay, Holy Spirit, why have I lost my peace here? That's refining. Second thing he's doing is to show the strength and beauty of your golden faith. He says that the faith is like gold. See, God leads us from glory to glory, not grotty to glory. He doesn't look at you as grotty and like, finally, somehow, if I put you through a muff misery, you're going to look golden. No, he says that your faith is gold. You have precious gold, and he wants to show it to you. You know, the size of your Goliath in front of you is telling you about the size of the faith that's in you. The size of the challenge that's in front of you, of the problem you maybe don't think you can solve, the emotion you haven't got over yet, the size of that thing shows you how great the faith already is inside of you because he's not putting anything in front of you he doesn't know you can't do and he wants to show you how awesome that faith is already inside of you by leading you in the process where you win it's like well I don't know what to do that thing is so big switch it around he's using that as a mirror to show you who you really are because he wouldn't put you into anything that he hasn't already put in you what you need to overcome it. Hello, church. That was good. That was a really good point. And the third thing, which I've already said, really, he wants to take you to the next level. And he doesn't want the next level to break you. When Jesus died on the cross, there's two bits to this, and we're nearly done. He was abused, he was tortured, he went through every kind of horror that we can imagine, and probably more, both spiritually and physically. And he died and he rose again from the dead. And I've said this to you before, Jesus went through unspeakable trauma, but his resurrection life was untraumatized. He should have needed therapy for being for PTSD because he experienced everything you would go through to give you post-traumatic stress disorder. But as he came out of the grave and rose again, the power of the Holy Spirit, the nature of the Holy Spirit is to free you from the effects of trauma. I think there's something more for us to experience in this as a body of Christ I know of at least two, one individual and one place. There's a place in the, the States that takes in soldiers with PTSD, many of them unbelievers, swearing, hardened, 
but it's a Christian environment, and it takes them through a process, <coughs> theof theophistic, theophastic counseling, I forgot the word wrong, but they have a 100% success rate of seeing these soldiers come out the other side without PTSD. There's a guy that works with Randy Clark where Jan's going, Mike Hutchins, and you see a phenomenal number of people basically healed of PTSD. Because the resurrection life of Jesus that's inside every one of us is actually free of PTSD and able to free us from the effect of trauma. That's how broad and great and deep and profound is the love of God inside every single human being, inside all of us. And he wants to take us to a new level. When Jesus rose from the dead, he definitely went to another level. I'm not, I'm not denying his divinity or anything like that, but he suddenly had his glory restored and it says, he says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Yeah? What he doesn't do with his authority is go beat up all the people that betrayed him and beat him up. He actually blesses them all. There's, there's a lesson for us. Is God wants to take us sometimes through difficulties with individuals but we get so healed up that when we come out of it, he gives us so much authority that we could actually take them out, but we use it to bless them. So we've, we've not just forgiven them, we've not just thanked God for them, but if we get put in a place of authority where we could really actually mark their life, make it hard for them, we don't do that. We use the authority we're given to bless the people that thought it was a good idea to make our life miserable. How about that for an attitude change? That's in us. He's taking us through stuff so that we bless our enemies. We love our enemies. We actually love them. We don't just have it as words, but we actually do love people that have become enemies to us. Because that's the nature of Jesus inside of us. He wants to take us to the next level. He wants to show us the greatness of the faith, the gold inside of us, and he wants to purify us through these seasons. Yeah? Remember, the size of your Goliath equals the size of the faith inside of you. Remember, what he's doing is taking you from one degree of glory to another through maybe a season of trial or test. Remember, whatever's bubbling up inside of you, he wants to release you from and heal you from amen okay we're going to land and we're going to worship here's how we're going to land this three ways to get out of clogged clogged up bits first of all confess it I have a pain God and re reveal to him the real nature of what it is that you carry called confession and invite the Lord into where you are now he's actually already there but we have to, he constantly looks for our cooperation and our willing partnering with him from the inside out he will not blow your beep beep doors off He's not going to put a stick of dynamite inside you, blow off all your resistance and come and rescue you. He's asking for permission. Number two, this is connected. So steps to healing through confession and invite the Lord in. Through yielding to his presence. We are actually plugged into the supercharged billion trillion volts of glorious blissful love that created the universe and keeps it all together that's all going on inside every one of us he wants us to lean into that reality and say yes again he's not going to blow your doors off he's looking for a yes 
And some of us are scared to say yes because we're scared what's going to come bubbling out of us if we say yes. I thought, I thought the aliens were landing. You did, thanks, Bo. <laughs> let, let the Holy Spirit put the passionate love of God right in your hot spot. Let Him do it. Because you know what? Before long, it won't be there anymore. Just the joy of the Lord that's your strength will be restored. There's nothing too big that he can't handle. Which involves this yielding. Just got to trust him for each step of your journey. Amen? You got to tr trust him. Well, you don't have to trust him, but it's highly advisable. And he is very trustworthy. And, and finally, forgive people that hurt you. I mean, I know this is simple. So I, hopefully, you've been hearing that there's a new level for you that the Lord wants to lead you into. And it, that process, though, can involve a level of test and trial. And the thing that gets many believers stuck is the pain that comes into them in the season of test and trial. Mm -hmm. Amen? Is this, is this an accurate summary? But... God, that where you've got to is not the end. So I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're like, well, I haven't had any trials recently. I'm doing very well. Great, fantastic. <laughs> Rejoice <laughs> in the fact you're not having any trouble. <laughs> but actually, if you're having trouble, rejoice. That's what the Bible says. In trial, rejoice. Because you know what happens? In rejoicing, you're expressing trust. In rejoicing, you're inviting me into your spot. In rejoicing, you're expressing hope rather than allowing the thing that's come in to be the thing that fills your, dream, your vision and your perspective. You're suddenly saying, I have another perspective. That giant is coming down because of the faith that's in me that my father knows is in me. So I'm excited about taking that giant down. I know that the million, trillion, zillion volts of the love of God is in me somewhere and I want that released and working and moving all the way through me so that I live in the fullness that he has called me to. And I'm not scared of letting him loose in my life. That's what happens when you rejoice. All right? So, Hope Church, it's time to sing. Yeah. Sing with hope. Sing with faith. Sing with joy in who he has called you to be. Because he turns every bit of mourning into dancing. He gives praise where there's been pain. That's who he is. So 